Um, most people see me on camera, but when I walk around uh, the streets of Jerusalem or wherever, uh, it's just best to get you on camera, me on to the side here. Uh -huh. I can make the funny faces while you, you know, okay. All right. <laughs> make good eye contact with Okay. Me. We're going to do a quick interview. Uh, it seems like every GAFCON or uh, every time I go to Uganda, I get a great interview from you. Uh, we talk about <laughs> lots of wonderful stuff because you're one of the key figures that help put together um, documents for the direction mm. of GAFCON. Mm. Uh, you were part of the Jerusalem Declaration. You helped write that. You were the idea group with that. You helped write the communique from Nairobi. Uh, and certainly you helped with the team here write the, the, uh, the communique from GAFCON 3. Mm. And this is a great time to talk about what goes into a communique. Yeah. How does one write a communique? Yeah. Now, a lot of people are like, well, how long is that going to take? We're not going to go an hour. Right. Maybe 45 minutes, maybe, who knows? Let, we'll let the spirit uh, certainly drive this. But you're the first person who ever brought notes to an interview. Uh oh. <laughs> so I'm, I'm preparing the, the viewer uh, for this up front. Um, and I want to set the scene here. Uh, there was a, a, a draft released yesterday of the communique. And there's three types of reaction. Finally. GAFCON gets it. They're going to really speak the truth and love um, to the wider Anglican <laughs> communion that has walk, walked away. You know, we're naming names, um, and, and this is it. Some were horrified. What do you mean, naming names? Well, why, and why are we so rough on Canterbury? And can't we all get along? And then there's, you know, uh, those who are just going to vote yes because they love the movement of GAFCON, and if this is what it takes to be the leading Anglican entity in the world, they'll do it. What goes into communique that uh, elicits that type of response? Tell me where you sit down and you say, um, what do we want the world to know about GAFCON? Right. Well, one of the things that GAFCON, in a way, has prided itself on, if I can use that word, for number one, number two, and number three, is that we did not have a pre-written communique. I uh, want to look at the prime example on the other side, the uh, Canterbury Primates meeting of 2016, where the, it, probably the communique was written weeks or months before the people left. Uh, so. And to be honest with you, I was feeling the need for prayer on this one when I arrived here uh, Saturday afternoon because I really didn't know what we were going to say, and we had one fewer day to prepare it. We were really looking at about three and a half days before we would get it out to, as the first draft. Uh, so in one sense, we were waiting on the Lord to guide us corporately. Having said that, um, in fact, I had been communicating by, by email with the groups uh, about some things. And if I may use my paper, here's something I wrote to them. I said, what should be the tone and spirit of the statement? And I said, it should be evangelical. It should be biblical. It should be concise and clear. It should be memorable. It should be bold and humble. It should be spiritual, both listening to the Spirit, but also in its tone. It should be edifying. It should be general in focus, but with personal and specific examples. So that's the kind of thing that I was sharing with the group before, beforehand. And um, I think I also proposed to them at our first meeting on... Uh, Sunday night, that we take three of the daily topics for exposition, God's gospel, God's church, God's world, and we use that as a kind of a framework. Because the statement is not simply a report of what happened, nor is it a, a, you know, a communique to the world uh, from nowhere, but it's trying to mix together the experience of the conference with 
the need to speak outside the con conference. And uh, so we came up, actually, uh, Archbishop Foley Beach proposed a new name, which was Letters to the Churches, a letter to the churches. The first one had been the state statement, Jerusalem Statement. Uh, well, the Jun Jerusalem Statement, which had the Jerusalem Declaration inside. And then we had the Nairobi Communique. And so at Archbishop Beach's uh, suggestion, this is the uh, GAFCON 2018 uh, letter to the churches. So those were some of the things that went into uh, the process before we actually started meeting and uh, putting our uh, words to uh, to print, such as it is. Well, tell me who who's on this committee with you? Who's writing? Yeah, um, well, uh, Archbishop Glenn Davies, the Bishop of Sydney, was the uh, chairman, and I was the convener. Um, and yeah, here. You don't mind? No, I don't mind at all. Uh, we had uh, people from various, various regions, uh, from Ireland, Tim Anderson, uh, who's the head of uh, the branch there, uh, uh, GAFCON Ireland. We had Alison Barfoot, who is an American, but who is actually a member of the Church of Uganda and, and a tremendous uh, servant of the Church of Uganda. Uh, the new Archbishop of Rwanda, Laurent uh, Mbanda, uh, Bishop David Anuo from Nigeria, who... Your microphone has slipped up into your... Okay. Thank you. okay. Yes. Is that okay? Yes. Uh, we had um, Dr. John Senyoni, who succeeded me as Vice Chancellor at Uganda Christian University and is uh, uh, a great leader in the East African revival. Actually, he and his wife read the statement in Nairobi back in 2013. Um, Bishop Tito Zavala, uh, former student of mine, Bishop of Chile. Uh, Bishop N Michael Nazar Ali, uh, who has been, I think, on all the statement committees and obviously is one of our great uh, uh, wise men. Uh, Dr. Mark Thompson, the uh, principal of Moore College in Sydney, who's been on, I think, all of the statement committees. Um, and then we had two very helpful uh, I don't want to call them gophers because they were more than that, but Bishop Michael Stead, who coordinated our work, he was the secretary, and then uh, Nigel Fortescue, who essentially helped set up everything, would run and provide whatever we needed from refreshments to uh, Xerox sheets, whatever. So, so it, it was a quite a varied group, and ultimately I think we came together, and uh, you know, I, I've already been getting little text messages of how grateful people were to work together. So that's that's the group. So you get together, you put together your message. Right. Letters to the church. Mm -hmm. um, Multi-components to it, speaking out, mm -hmm. gathering other information from the people who are there. Um, for the 2,000 people who went to GAFCON, 2,000 people had a different experience. How do you really codify that? Yeah, well, of course, it's funny because the, the, the statement group is almost working underground during this. Now, we did go to all of the plenary sessions in the morning, um, but like when they had the, the network groups and seminars in the afternoons, we went off into our own little room. So we, and I think that the, the most uh, ironic thing was that yesterday, Thursday, when we were, uh, had collected the, uh, comments on the draft statement, we thought we could go for the photograph at the temple steps. But when we saw the, the size, the lines, and we began calculating how many hours it would take for 2,000 people to get to the temple and back, most of us almost simultaneously decided, no, nope, we're not going to do that. And so we went back to our room and started working about 4 o'clock and we worked, worked through till a little after midnight on that final statement. So what makes, well, let's talk a little bit about the difference between um, the first communicator, draft communique yep. and the final. Um, right. Tell me what the reactions were to the, the draft and what surprised you. Right, right, right. Well, in one way it didn't surprise me at all because it happened in Nairobi, and maybe in Jerusalem the first time, 
part of the process is that it's not just us. We're the servant of the conference. We're the servant of the assembly. So we propose, and then they react, and then it's our responsibility to sort of incorporate their reactions. And you get various ones. Now, of course, you have to balance the fact that in every group there's always somebody who's going to be a nitpicker and a critic. Um, and good grammar people. <laughs> yes, that's right. Um, and... Um, also, well, so uh, when we read the draft statement, there was this huge number of people who stood up and cheered. So you could almost say, well, why bother going further? But when we got into the regional groups, uh, we found there was quite a bit of comment. And, uh, but I will say, in general, the groups you might expect to be gung-ho, like Nigeria and Uganda, didn't have basic objections. In the British group, you might not be surprised, there were a lot of objections. I actually attended the American one, and I was somewhat surprised, um, not just that people had this and that, but there seemed to be some question about the whole thing. But I would say one of the basic things that came out of that American group was a proposal that we take um, the more specific uh, political side, I guess, of that, uh, and put it at the end rather than at the beginning. And so if you look at the, the first draft, we started out with the history of GAFCON from 1998 to 2008 to 2018. Whereas in the final draft, we deal with these topics from the conference on proclaiming Christ faithfully to the nations, God's, God's uh, gospel, God's church, God's world. And it's in the section on God's church, we call it reforming God's church, that we begin to deal with the specific problems and crises facing the Anglican Communion. So I think by shifting that, it gave a more positive sense of, you know, we're dealing with this, but it's as part of a larger context of how do we preach the gospel to the world and, and what impact does that have on the church. I think that was the main thing. There were a few little things uh, people were concerned about the tone sounded triumphalistic. Um, I'll give you an example here from the... We had a statement which I've made over the years, which I heard at the first GAFCON. That it, the question was, are you leaving the Anglican Communion? And the answer was, no, we are the Anglican Communion. So we actually had that in the first draft. Some people said, oh, that's too triumphalistic. You, I am the Anglican Communion, and that means you're not. So in the um, final draft, it's, it reads, we're not leaving the Anglican Communion. We are the majority of the Anglican Communion seeking to remain faithful to our Anglican heritage. It says the same thing. Yeah. And I, I will say, as I was hearing it read and then and finishing the, the conference, I thought, you know, this is the Anglican Communion. Just be there. Just watch it. We don't even need to say we are the Anglican Communion. We just live it out. We're walking it out. So to that extent, I was willing to give up that little uh, phrase. But I think there was one piece that really was central to me, and uh, it stayed in even though we moved the location. And it was a quotation from um, Archbishop Nicholas Oko, the chairman. And I heard him say this in a meeting and, you know, I've been writing and studying Anglican Communion things for 20 years, but it somehow clicked in a way that I hadn't quite thought before. And here's what he said. He said, we are merely doing what the Communion leadership should have done to uphold its own resolution in 1998. And I've often said, if, you know, if George Carey would have taken the view in 1998, the Episcopal Church... The communion has speak its mind, spoken its mind on, on this issue of sexuality. Now I expect you to fall into line, conform. Where would we be today? Well, I think we would have an Episcopal cult somewhere. They would not be part of the Anglican communion. But you would need somebody to replace the Episcopal cult, and that would be the Anglican Church in North America. Okay, so that explains the two, you know, newsworthy requests to the Archbishop of Canterbury that he invite as full members to Lambeth 2020, bishops of the province, 
of the Anglican Church in North America and of the province of the Anglican Church in Brazil, and that he not invite bishops of those provinces which have endorsed by word and deed sexual practices that are in contradiction to the teaching of Scripture and Revelation, I'm sorry, Resolution 110, um, unless they've repented their actions and reversed their decisions. So you can kind of see, in a way, we're saying, in order to go forward, we have to go back. And we've got to be honest in carrying out what the communion stated was the teaching of Jesus, the teaching of the Bible, and God's creator, the Creator's will for human uh, relationships. It is remarkable, 10 years on, I've been to these meetings, Dar es Salaam, all the emergency primates meetings, we have never had follow through with um, sanctions to the Episcopal Church. Uh, we sent Rod Williams to the House of Bishops in Louisiana. Would you please talk to the Episcopal Church and get them to have a moratorium and repentance? Nothing. And, you know, Canterbury is so worried about what, what are you complaining about? You know, yeah. it, it, we moved on. We moved on. Why right. can't we move on? Yep. And I think in the, in the communique, you express why we're not moving yep. on. Well, I've, over in my writings over the years, I've quoted several times the Lambeth Conference resolution in 1920 that says that marriage of a man and a woman is God's unchangeable standard. Uh, and I've said, uh, if it's unchangeable, it's unchangeable. And I'm sorry, if the Archbishop of Canterbury wants to say what was unchangeable is now changeable, that's a problem. <laughs> so um, that, I think, is why we have to go back to where things went off the tracks. Of course, in the meantime, there's been 20 years of growth in other ways. I mean, the crisis caused by Lambeth uh, after Lambeth 1998 brought people in the global south and some of us in the west who were being basically excluded together in ways that we couldn't have imagined. I mean, obviously in my case, it led to 10 years of working in Uganda, but there's all sorts of interrelationships that have built up over this time. So in that sense, we're not going back to 1998. But, but in terms of spiritually and theologically, we're saying we're not going to debate that issue. Uh, it's a matter of whether or not uh, the Lambeth leadership wants to go their own way or not. Back to the communicator. Today we deliver the final communique, and I heard nothing of complaints, mm. not even grammar complaints. Probably the hardest part. Yep. Um, you guys worked all night. You have a cold that you caught coming <laughs> into town, and uh, that's something to help. But when you guys really, you know, put to work the tone that you got mm -hmm. back from the, the participants, the right. delegates, you got it right. I think so. I mean. The, the trick was we didn't want to back off on the substantial matters, that this is a really serious theological crisis facing the Anglican Communion. On the other hand, we wanted to speak the truth in love, in charity, uh, and, and with a, uh, you know, a humility. It was funny because we actually, at one point, we were, uh, they had accused us of calling the leadership of the, ch of the uh, communion to repent. And so we kind of said, we better do a check on how many times the word repent occurs. Well, we did. And what we found was actually we had said repent more for ourselves than for, for, for Canterbury because we recognized that we've failed also. Sometimes it's been failing to stand firm. Sometimes it's been failing in some of our own inconsistencies. I think you know, I've had this discussion before that uh -huh. we didn't get here just because of their action. Yeah. We got here because of our community. Right. So there was that desire to try to make sure that the final uh, you know, communique communicated that, that sense of humility. Um, and, uh, and I think we did succeed. I, I think the people that I was most concerned about, there were some of the British people who were sympathetic to GAFCON, uh, who were in their own particular problems, ecclesiastical problems, but I think wanted something that they could take back. 
and say, hey, this is, this is really, I commend this. And I did talk uh, with a couple of them afterwards, and I think they were satisfied. Whether they would ultimately stay away from Lambeth themselves, I don't know. But, uh, but at least they felt that they, you couldn't just say, oh, there's that angry group out there in, you know, Ginger group. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that was the ginger group was funny because I, I felt like, you know, saying some ginger group. You know? If they want to call this a ginger group, and Gaff kind of went, fine. Have have your have your fun. Gaff kind two. No. Uh uh. Gaff kind three. What are you blind? You know, the, we're not a ginger group. The, there's no way the the leading uh, entity in the Anglican community is a is a ginger group. Um, kind of lost my train of thought there. I was going to say, I, I had a great follow-up question. Well, let's continue with yours, and I'll think of my follow-up. Well, I, I, I think the ginger group comment was made a couple months ago, and I think that they actually were hoping that by pulling enough strings with some of the bishops and others around, the commu that, that they could actually uh, defeat GAFCON. They could undermine it. And one way was to, to make it sound like it was this little pressure group. Um, and I think that it became clear in the last week or so that that strategy had failed. So then we get the, the letter from Archbishop Fearon, you know, which is much more, I would call it, I wrote something called ferrying the primates across the Rubicon. This is called bullying the, the primates across the Rubicon. Uh, it, it, that was threatening, you know, schism, uh, throwing out all the scare words, uh, and I think that indicated that uh, the people uh, up there began to realize that this conference was actually going to come off. Well, for the ACNA, Catherine Jefferson and Gafcon, Catherine Jeffrey Shorey was the catalyst. Mm. Without her, mm -hmm. none of, you know, we want to be here in this nice hotel on a beautiful day during Shabbat. I don't know. I'm not sure I agree with that, uh, Kevin. Um, it's true, she was a particularly obnoxious personality. But I'll, I'll tell you this funny story. One of the things that, that they wanted us, and I think it's actually in the communique, not to refer to the Archbishop of Canterbury, but the office of the Archbishop of Canterbury as the instrument. And I thought that was a little pedantic. But I will say this. I've, over these 20 years, I've seen, you know, the leadership of George Carey, Rowan Williams, uh, and now Justin Welby. And there's not much difference in terms of what they actually do. They have different personalities, but the, the ship sails on in the same direction. And I would say the same thing about the Episcopal Church, from Frank Griswold to Catherine Shorey, you know, to Michael Curry. Definitely different personalities, but the ship keeps sailing along. So to that extent, I think the office does make some sense. There's something that they, when they get into that office, whatever other ideas they might have, either they're watching their minders or I don't know what it is. In, in uh, Justin Welby's first press conference, he says, I'm just like Rowan Williams, but I have a shaver. Mm, you okay. Know, so yeah. uh, I, you're right about uh, that. I was just thinking about a catalyst for um, GAFCON and your growth was... Justin Welby inviting Michael Curry to give a, a sermon at yeah. his wedding in, yeah. in Britain. And I'm like, I've seen a change now in the moderate uh, primates that aren't here. Uh, I don't know if yeah, know. I don't know. Uh, honestly, I don't know. I, I think that um, for those of us who have followed this, uh, you know, over the time, it didn't surprise us. That is, it seems clear that Justin Welby um, intends uh, Lambeth 2020 to be the time when uh, the Episcopal Church is welcomed back into the fold and the same-sex agenda is, is accepted as walking together. Um, it, it did seem a little bold for him to invite Curry to, to do that. Um, I don't think it affected attendance at this meeting. Uh, or well, even the bishops. Too soon for that. Yeah, yeah. But, but certainly, it would seem to me that he's clearly shown where he wants to go. I've been kind of fisking things that he's written to try to say this is where he's going. But I think inviting Michael Curry, you don't need to fisk that. <laughs> Gafcon four. 
months. It was something new in five. Yeah. Um, what I saw lacking, in just my personal opinion, was ecumenical. Meaning outside of Anglicanism? Well, yeah, people mm -hmm. coming here to visit and support, pray mm. for us, you know. Had it in, in Nairobi, we had it in uh, GAFCON 1, mm -hmm. the uh, Coptics, the Orthodox, yeah. the Eastern and Russian. Yeah. Sometimes you get uh, somebody from Rome mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. to show and be a right. representative. Right. Um, that wasn't here. I really, I really can't speak to that. I don't know whether efforts were made or not. Of course, you had, you know, the Bishop of Jerusalem came and uh, seemed to be offering a scripted message uh, from Canterbury. Yeah, thought, yeah anyway. Um, and, you know, Rome has changed now. I, you know, I'm not sure whether Rome would send something, you know, uh, there. Uh, so I don't really know whether that was intentional. I do think uh, that the intention of GAFCON is to make the Anglican Communion again a genuinely uh, global, international Christian body that will have an impact all over the world. And if it does that, then I think the ecumenical ties will, will emerge. Are you going to continue blogging? I don't know. Contendinganglican.org. Um, <laughs> I will for a while, and we'll see. Uh, I enjoy it in one way, uh, but for instance, I'm just not one of those people that can multitask, so I haven't done anything for a week. I'll probably maybe say some of these things uh, on there, but keep your eyes open. I, I'll come up with something perhaps every week or two. Normally we sit down, we have some french fries on a, a bar in Nairobi. I'm going to do that this time. I want to thank you for your time, and I look forward to our interview at GAFCON 4. Great. Thank you very much, Kevin.